Okay, we're going to start with a little bit of business before we uh, get started in the interview. Uh, this interview is being recorded as part of the Albert and Pauline Dubin Oral History Archives. Richard, do you give permission to the Leonard N. Simons Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes and for use as deemed appropriate by the archives? I do. I am Michael Burke. I'm the chairman of the Archives Committee, and I will be leading this uh, interview. So let's start at the beginning, Richard. Uh, talk about your, your parents and your family uh, growing up. Well, I, I'm a native Detroiter. Uh, I, actually, I was born in Highland Park, but uh, that's close enough. Um, I was born in, on Valentine's Day in 1943. I always told my mother that I was the best Valentine's present she ever got. Um, I'm not sure she believed that sometimes, but, uh, um, and um, I, I grew up in Detroit. Um, my family was here, oh, probably since the 1920s. Uh, my grandmother <coughs> had a uh, delicatessen on uh, Fenkel and Homer what was the called name of the Modern book? Delicatessen, which uh, in its day was, was uh, one of the meeting places of business Detroit. Uh, there were probably more deals done in the 40s and 50s over a corned beef sandwich at that deli than in any other place. Um, and I grew up there. I, I went there every Saturday night to see my Bobby and, and have a corned beef sandwich. Um, and um, that was the, in the family until 1967. And the events in and around uh, Detroit in the summer of 1967 convinced my uncle to sell the, the business and, and leave. And my mother, my grandmother, was was uh, pretty much out of the business by then. What was your grandmother's name? Uh, uh, Minnie. And uh, my parents uh, uh, were not native Detroiters. Uh, they were both born in Toronto. Um, and an interesting little tidbit is, is that they, that I always found interesting, is that they were actually born two months apart in the same house. Wow. Um, because my, my mother's family had just come to Toronto uh, in 1913, several months before she was born. Um, and um, I guess they knew the Krugel family that had been there since the uh, 1890s and uh, they needed a place to live, and the Krugel family uh, took them in. That's the way the world worked back then, at least in the Jewish community. What was the reason that they came to Detroit? <sighs> I don't know. I, I think uh, my, my grandmother's uh, brother um, was here. He was an attorney um, and, and lived in Detroit, and I, I, think, I think times were a little hard for the family in, in Toronto. Uh, it was war, uh, probably just after World War II, I mean World War I. Um, and I think uh, that uh, there was some business opportunities for, for her. Uh, she started with a um, uh, cleaning and uh, tailor shop on uh, Brush Street. And uh, I remember my dad always telling stories of, of growing up in his very early years on Brush Street, which was a pretty interesting place. Uh, even then. Uh, even then. Um, and, uh, but he, he wound up growing up in the city. He was a very bright man. His name was Ben. And uh, he graduated uh, Northern High School at uh, age 15. Um, and then he went to uh, City College, now Wayne State. Uh, graduated with a chemistry d degree and uh, uh, probably at age 19 or 20 tried to get a job and couldn't because he was Jewish. Um, so he did lots of other things in his early life, wound up working for the state, uh, for the Treasury Department, uh, uh, kept him out of Europe during World War II. Um, I always told an interesting story that I found interesting about uh, liquid bleach. He and a, a partner developed liquid bleach. And he was selling it in the north, the Midwest, northern Midwest. 
And he gave the business up because he was on the road all the time and he didn't like it. About six months after he gave this uh, liquid bleach business up, um, Clorox came out. So I always found that to be a very interesting, again, timing is everything. Right. Um, but uh, my mom was, um, came here uh, after they got married. Uh, she grew up in Toronto. Uh, what was your mom's name? Jenny. Um, and uh, they got married um, uh, in 1936. And then she moved here. And um, uh, we were born and raised. I, have an old, I had an older brother, Larry, who recently passed away. And uh, my sister, Carol, is younger than I am by many years. And uh, she lives now in northern Michigan. What part of northern Michigan is she? She lives in a town called Wolverine, which is right there. Um, on the, um, it's, it's just off I-75. It's about 30 miles from the bridge. And, and it's a nice place to visit. <laughs> why the migration up there? She, um, she and her husband were, were looking for a place for the summer. And unfortunately, he passed away at a young age. Um, and uh, he passed away t two weeks before they were supposed to close on the property. And uh, despite my sister's older brothers giving her advice not to close, she decided to close on the property. She started going up there, you know, just for weekends and summertime. And she found that she liked it and that it was very hard to live in Lansing being a young widow. Mm -hmm. um, she just felt she was not totally comfortable with her role. So she went up there and made a new life, uh, wound up meeting a, a nice gentleman on the internet, got remarried about 10 years ago, Wonderful. and they're very happy. Wonderful. And I have a place to visit. Wonderful. So tell, tell me about your life growing up in, uh, in Detroit. What were, the, what were your interests, your involvements, family dynamic? Well, growing up in Detroit, um, I, was, I first lived on Dexter Davison. Um, I watched, I was part of the migration. Um, and I lived on Dexter Davis until I was in the fifth grade, went to Winter Halter School. I was a normal kid, lots of friends. We, we uh, played in the neighborhood. We spent summers playing on the uh, lot at uh, Dexter Davis, at uh, the Davison uh, Center. Played a little bit of baseball there and things like that. Um, went to day camp there, um, and uh, nothing special. Um, I did well in school, and uh, then in uh, 1953, uh, my dad came home one day and said, we're moving, and uh, we moved to Cherry Lawn in uh, northwest Detroit, went to Bagley School, um, made wonderful friends, um, that I have to this day. Um, I love to look at my bar mitzvah album and see the girls that were there then at my bar mitzvah who I still am in contact with. Um, and uh, and uh, wound up going to um, post uh, middle school or junior high school and uh, four years at Mumford. Uh, and uh, nothing special. It was um, the, the best, the most special thing about those years was when I was 16 years old in, um, I went to uh, Fresh Air Camp in Brighton as a, as a waiter. I was the, in the last year of waiters that, that Fresh Air Camp had. Um, I had a great summer. Um, uh, made great friends, again, most of whom I'm still in contact with. And um, the next year I went as a junior counselor, and then I went as a counselor, and I, I spent seven summers at Fresh Air Camp. And uh, it really was a significant part of what my future became, uh, because when I came back to Detroit, I wanted to get involved again with the camp. I wound up going on the board and eventually becoming the president of, of uh, uh, 
uh, Fresh Air Society uh, in 1985. So it really connected me to, to the community. I found out there was a community. And um, I, I still see my campers to this day, uh, some of whom are very good friends of mine, and um, several of whom were went to camp on scholarships and and I really learned what the community did. Uh, it was a little piece of the community but it was enough to make you proud of your community and, and want to do such something and of course when I came back to Detroit after my uh, training and being in the Air Force it was it was just, it was the a door in to giving back and to being part of a community. So when you were growing up, I, you, you talked about, we have a lot of parallels that we'll talk about in our lives. We may have even played baseball on the same uh, field at the same Very time. Very possible. Um, how about religiously? Was Did religion play an, a part in your family's uh, uh, DNA when you were growing up? Well, up till we moved to Northwest Detroit, um, my father uh, attended a, an Orthodox synagogue, although he, we were not Orthodox. Um, but he knew Rabbi Wolgelanter, uh, and yes. uh, uh, Rabbi Wolgelanter's shul was on, um, was Mogan of Rome, which was on the property where the Yeshiva Beth Yehuda was, on uh, Dexter and Cortland, I believe. And so that was my growing up. That was my early Jewish. Now it's interesting that I went to that shul as a kid, but I went to the United Hebrew Schools for education. Um, and uh, wh when we moved to Northwest Detroit, my father joined um, Beth Aaron which was conservative, and he put me in the afternoon yeshiva on, uh, on Wyoming for my education. So, very confused as a young kid uh, as, to where, as to where you are in, in the Jewish world. Um, but we grew up in a conservative home. I, I like to joke now that, that it was a modern, uh, we, we, we kept, uh, we kept modern kosher. We had meat, milk, and treif. You know, we had a set of glass dishes for, for the Chinese food that we used to bring <laughs> into our house. So, that's funny. Um, so you were bar mitzvah. You had your bar, bar mitzvah, mitzvah at, Beth, at Beth, Aaron. Beth Aaron, and uh, was part of the junior congregation there. And and uh, um, our family was what is a, probably now typically conservative in terms of of observing all the holidays. We had a Shabbat dinner every Friday night, although my father never said a Kiddush or, or made the motzi. Uh, but we had bread and we had wine, and uh, we, that's how we grew up, and, and Friday night was Friday night and with a typical Shabbat dinner. Um, when I went away to college, I probably was a reformed Jew, like most conservative Jews, masquerading in conservative Judaism. And I still believe that's the, what's happening today. Where do you belong now? I, we belong to Shard Tzedek. Uh, my wife is, is more religious, more observant than I am. She's very comfortable there. And uh, we've ra we raised our family there, uh, but only one of our three children belongs there now. Are they all here? They all live in Detroit. We'll talk about them a little bit later on. In this We're interview. very lucky. Yeah. Um, so did you have any other involvement like USY, AZA? Were those a part of the things that you did growing up? I was a member of Mendelssohn AZA um, during high school, uh, mostly for sports. Played a lot of softball and, and basketball. and. Um, a lot of friends were part of that system. Um, I, I think it was just what we did. Uh, you know, we didn't think about it. We just, that was it, we did it. Um, my dad was a Shriner, um, a, a Mason, 
Uh, my brother was in Dima Lay, but I never went that way. I, I went through B'nai B'rith. So you, you, you talked about you went to, obviously you went to school, high school here, and uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about, you, you talked about your friendships and the education, but I want to talk about uh, your decision to go from high school to where you went for, to university, and uh, was the medical thought in your head by then, or uh, did that take some evolution? Uh, Probably not. My dad, at that time, my dad was an accountant um, and did public accounting. Um, I really didn't think about what I wanted to be. I was probably like every other kid, wanted to be a baseball player or a policeman or whatever at any particular time. Um, I went, uh, my, my brother preceded me at Michigan and there was no question that that was where I wanted to go to school. Um, and uh, I w applied and, and got into Michigan. Um, and I, he went to medical school. And I think that influenced me. And uh, I decided I liked science. Uh, and I decided that I'd probably, that, that sounded as good as anything uh, in, uh, in, in terms of a career. So I chose medicine. Were you and your brother close growing up? Um, we were three and a half years apart, so we weren't really friends. We were brothers. Um, we did things together. We, you know, threw a football in, in the streets and, and together, and and played catch and uh, threw the ball against the stoops to play stoop baseball and, and those kinds of things as kids, but I, I don't, we were enough apart that we really didn't mix. Um, we were different. Uh, my mother always used to tell me that, gee, I know everything your brother does, I know nothing that mm. you do. So we, we were two different people, uh, really, and, and it showed in our growing up, I think. But he did go, he preceded me at, at uh, Fresh Air Camp. That may be a reason why I, I wound up mm -hmm. going there. Um, so I did follow him uh, in choosing medicine, and, and, and he had those influences on me. So when you were at U of M, were you involved in any way Jewishly? Um, rarely went into Hillel for a, in a party. Uh, I was a member of Alpha Epsilon Pi fraternity uh, the three years I was an undergraduate. Um, and very active in, in, in that, and, and it was very Jewish. And, you know, most of our events were with the Jewish sororities and at that time. I mean, things have dramatically changed yes, <laughs> over yeah. the last uh, 50 years, but, uh, but that at that time, um, Jewish was Jewish. Uh, uh, there was a lot, of, a lot more separation than there is today. Um, and uh, so your sphere of, of friendships, your sphere of, of uh, activities were pretty much controlled by the fact that you were Jewish and there was an active Jewish community on campus and I think that that directed uh, Jewish kids to, to remain Jewish, which is interesting because today I think it's much harder. Even when my kids went to school, I know that the fraternities and sororities had liberalized, uh, the Jewish fraternities were taking non-Jews, the, the um, uh, sororities the same. Uh, and I think that made it much harder. You know, when you look at all the polls today and you look at the Pew Report and you look at uh, 20 years ago, the Berman uh, study that, that shocked the Jewish community, um, I think we saw it happening. We didn't realize it was happening because it was it was so um, easy. Uh, the assimilation was so easy, uh, particularly on the campuses. But we saw it happening. It was there. So I'm going to go out. You know, this is this is just a template. But let's talk about it because you raise an interesting issue. You know, obviously, there's a big concern in the community about retention and keeping our kids Jewish. So you, you have had kind of a width and breadth of experience in the community at a whole variety of venues. 
what from your perspective are the things that we have to do as a community to keep our kids here and also to keep them Jewish? Well, I've been always involved in, in, in my time here, um, both locally and nationally in, in Jewish education. And I think that's primary. I, I, I think there's no question that we need to fix Jewish education. I, I don't think that, uh, that the afternoon school system is thriving. I don't think it thrived when my kids were being educated. I think that there's, there's a wrong emphasis on, on what they do. I know in the conservative movement, the teaching of kids in school even today is synagogue skills. And my kids are very comfortable in the synagogue. They can daven. But are they learn it? I'm not so sure. <coughs> did, they, did they really learn what being a Jew is? I don't know. Uh, I think they learned their Jewishness, and they all are practicing Jews and affiliated today in, in one stream or another. I think they learned that in the home. So I think we need to look at the Jewish education. I think the best parts of Jewish education today and for the last probably 40 years are, are the uh, camps um, and, and uh, the uh, uh, interactive kinds of things where they live Judaism. Uh, I, so I think that's one, one piece of it. I think we really have to figure that out uh, as to how we educate our children Jewishly. Um, I, I think that um, the, uh, a, a lot of uh, the, the neighborhoods were a huge thing. The change from when I grew up, we were in a ghetto. I mean, basically, um, either, you went, uh, either we went to Mumford High School or there was a small enclave at Oak Park. Uh, and then Southfield was a small enclave. Uh, and before us, uh, my brother went to Durfee, uh, but went to Mumford because we moved, uh, but Central High School. And I think that until, the, until the 1967, Jews lived in ghettos, even in this city. Um, not the case anymore. They're all over. And you have pockets, kids, you know, pockets of, of Jewish kids in, in our... Uh, all neighborhoods and, and, uh, and all public schools. Um, and that, again, that leads to assimilation. That's great. That's what America is. It's great for the Jewish community. Probably not. Um, so I think that's a big part of, of keeping, of, of looking at that generation and trying to keep, uh, keep our children actively Jewish. We have to make Judaism something they love. And that starts in the home. Um, that comes from affiliation. There are, the Pew study clearly shows that there's a decrease in affiliation going on among the, the next generation uh, or the current next generation. Um, and and there's inter it's an interesting dynamic. Um, there are some areas of hope. I think the Kavara system that, 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 that it's interesting. We have a young cousin who we became friendly with when they moved to New York. Um, and we meet with them now. Um, and um, she said that uh, we were talking about the Pew study because she said the Pew study missed of the Havara group. Nobody ever asked them, and they're very active. They have a small Havara synagogue uh, that's very active, uh, very Jewish, uh, celebrate all the holidays together. And, and that's a, a bright spot, I think. And, and we have to look at that as a community, as, as a Jewish national Jewish community and look at those kinds of activities because again it gets back to experiential and we see experiential working in the camps uh, I think we're starting to see it in the in the Havara movements uh, and the small group synagogues and I think that if we look at that and say this is a way to live Jewishly um, 
I, I think there's, there's something to be done in that avenue in recreating a Jewish family life in a Jewish home. I couldn't agree with more of what you said. So let's talk about the other part of the coin, and that's keeping our kids here. It's, a, it's a, an important um, challenge, I think, that's facing a lot of agencies in, a, in the community as a whole, the Federation in particular. Uh, I, I want to kind of get your, your spin on what you think we, you know, I know it's that J-O-B-W-J-O-B-S word yes. is, a, is a, a key, but I, I want to get your take on it, Richard. Yeah. Well, I've always been a fan of the city of Detroit. I mean, I grew up in Detroit's heyday, as you did, and that was our city. We, we lived Detroit. We, our, our dates in high school were downtown Detroit. Uh, uh, our activities were Detroit-based. Um, I think that there is a renaissance going on. I'm very excited about what Next Gen is doing. Uh, it's exciting to go downtown. I, I went down to the, uh, the uh, downtown synagogue um, uh, last year for a Friday night. It, it was amazing what was going on. And, and more of our community needs to go down there and see what's going I'm a on. Member down there. Chabad, I'm a member down there now, too. I mean, the first thing I did was write my membership check to support the right. downtown synagogue. Um, Chabad is down there. It's, uh, you know, just down the street. It's, it's very exciting. Uh, I, kudos to Dan Gilbert. I mean, uh, for coming back here, for being a Detroiter, for, for Yes, he's a businessman, and yes, he's investing, you know, and, and, and doing very well in his businesses, uh, even in buying and rehabbing Detroit. But he is putting his money into Detroit, and, and uh, I think, I hope it's very successful. Detroit has many problems. Uh, the biggest problem Detroit has is, is, is the neighborhoods, and they have to figure out how to change that. But that may come. That's a much harder problem. To, to deal with than what's going on in in the center city and the in the Woodward corridor, but it's exciting and and uh, it's bringing young people back to Detroit. Um, I have no secret plan. Uh, I mean, our kids just grew up here and stayed here. I didn't have a business for them to go into. I uh, they just had friends. Their friends stayed. They stayed. Um, and um, they're very happy living in Detroit. They chose to be here. We love it. You know, having six grandchildren that we see all the time is, is a real mitzvah for us. Um, so, but I, I, I think that how do we do it? We just have to keep after, you know, we have to make it the right place for our kids to grow up. We have to show them that, that Detroit's a wonderful city. Uh, we have advantages. I mean, economically right now, it's far easier for a young couple to live in Detroit uh, than in, in Washington, D.C., right. or New York City, or Chicago, or L.A. You know, I've got friends in L.A. for over the years uh, uh, that, you know, they came to my kids' bar mitzvahs and saw my house in Southfield and asked me how much it cost, and I told them, and they couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were living in twenty-five, thirty, forty thousand dollar homes, and, and that were beautiful homes, and, and they couldn't believe it because they were living in very similar homes at at four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so, we have advantages; we have to use them. Yeah. Uh, and and as you said, jobs is the big thing. We have to be creative, and we have to get young people here. But we need an infrastructure too. Uh, you know, it's great for young, young single people downtown. It's very active right now in the Jewish community. They, they love being there. What do they do when they get married? What do they do when they start having kids? Right. They need, we need infrastructure. We, we need to be able to provide infrastructure to keep kids living here. If that happens, you start rebuilding community. I want to take a step back before we get into uh, talking about your family, because we this last question, series of questions sort of leapfrogs them. Talk about your, uh, 
your career, your professional career, your school, you're going to medical school, and <coughs> the whole, uh, um, the, that whole decision. And I, I went to um, uh, Michigan, um, decided early on that I was going to go to medical school. Uh, my father, my brother had gone to medical school after three years because Michigan at the time took three-year students as long as you had done all your sciences. And um, I guess that was my journey too because I did the same thing. Would I have done it again that way today? No. I would have spent the fourth year in undergraduate school because I gave up so much that U of M had to offer. I never had time for music appreciation, for art, for some of the, the uh, history uh, classes that were so important and, and so great to take there, that there was there for our, for our taking. I didn't have the time. My dad's philosophy was, well, you get done with school early, it gives you one year at the end of your career of peak earning. He was an accountant. <laughs> I said, what, what's the big deal? I start a year later. He says, no, it's a year at the end, not at the beginning. Um, and he's right and, and from dollars and cents. But did, was it a good decision? I don't know. I would have, uh, going back, thinking about where I am today and what I do, we love the symphony. I don't understand the symphony, but we love it. I love listening to the music, but it would have been nice to have that background. And it was there for the, mm -hmm. for the taking, and we didn't take it. Um, I, I went to medical school uh, at Michigan and graduated in 67. Um, when I started going to medical school, I probably went to medical school thinking I'd be a psychiatrist and, and live with children, uh, or work with children. Uh, I love the time I spent at, at uh, Fresh Air Camp. I always wanted the heart, you know, we all had those difficult kids we knew about when they came to camp and, and I always liked taking them in my bunk and working with them and they were great. It was, it was a, a challenge but they were great kids. And some of them I know today and they turned out great as well and, and, and contribute to our community in, in many great ways. Um, so that's why I probably went to medical school. When I got into the, the uh, third year in the clinical aspects of, of medical school, I really found I liked surgery. I liked doing things with my hands. I liked, as a kid, I always tried to fix broken radios and, you know, if I, sometimes I was successful and if not, they were still broken, you know, but, but I always liked playing with my hands, doing things, putting things together. And I really found that I like surgery. And uh, so I decided um, for two reasons. One, I felt there were, uh, that there were other avenues for psychiatric care, uh, social work, psychologists, PhDs. There was only one avenue for surgeons, medical school. Right. So um, I said, I don't want to waste a seat in medical school. So I, I originally um, decided to be a general surgeon. I really wanted to be a vascular surgeon. I was uh, one of the vascular surgeons, uh, Dr. William Fry at, at the University of Michigan, really influenced me. I did some work for him and uh, some, a little bit of research for him. And I really liked vascular surgery and that's what I was going to do. And uh, I went into general surgery and I found out that I really didn't like general surgery. To, you have to do general surgery to get vascular surgery. And two years into general surgery, I decided that that wasn't for me. I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, change my berry plan because that was Vietnam. And uh, if the only way to not go to Vietnam as a doctor was to have a deferment for residency. There was something called the Berry Plan that you volunteered for, um, and uh, that allowed you to finish your residency and then go in as a specialist. Uh, I had the Berry Plan in general surgery. Uh, I was very nervous when I switched, but I was able to, they, the Air Force needed orthopedic surgeons, I guess. So I wanted, they, they switched my Berry Plan, 
and I did an orthopedic residency in Brooklyn, New York. Um, great time. <laughs> really important time because until I went to Brooklyn, New York, till we went uh, with Sally and a young family, um, we were Detroiters. We had our family with us. Sally came from Flint, not very far. Uh, we, we visited, we were with our families all the time. My mom still was making Shabbat dinners that we went to. Um, and being forced away, going to Brooklyn, New York, helped us grow up, helped us grow as, as a couple, as a married couple. And we didn't, we, ha we were on our own. Very important for our, for who we became and, and how we developed. And Brooklyn was a great place. What's so bad? We had the New York Philharmonic. I, one of my uh, attendings had uh, Ranger tickets, so every time the Wings were in town, I got to go see them. Um, it was just a great place. Um, uh, and um, it, it also helped Jewishly because it was New York. And you just lived a different kind of life. Um, and then after my residency, um, I had to give two years to the Air Force. And we went to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, spent two years in, in the uh, U.S. Air War College. I didn't know there was an Air War College, but there, I found out. Um, and some of the things that happened along that journey really made a difference in our lives over the, the last 40 years when we came back to Detroit. Very good. So you, you gave me a good lead in to talk about something that I know you hate to talk about. Let's talk about your family. Uh, talk about your beautiful bride and then your kids and uh, grandkids. Yes. Well, Sally um, came into my life. Uh, I was a sophomore. I was a sophomore and she was a freshman in Ann Arbor. We got fixed up um, by a, a friend of mine who had, I knew from Fresh Air. From, we had worked together at, at camp for several years. A, a lady named Jan Friedman, who has subsequently de deceased, but was a lovely young person. And, and um, she fixed us up. and. Uh, we eventually went out on a date. It didn't happen quite the way she thought it would, but we eventually went out on a date. And um, we uh, found the trials of dating and going together and not going together and going together. And, but we got married in, in, I was in medical school in, in 1964, so we just had our 50th anniversary in December. Um, and that was, it, talking about a, a Jewish renaissance, that changed my life because Sally came from a much more um, involved Jewish family. Um, uh, they were, they, she grew up in Flint and then Bay City. There weren't Orthodox congregations. They were conservative. Her father in his later years was the shamus at the shul in Flint. Um, her mother was, absolutely a, a, an Orthodox Jew. And um, I learned a lot. I, and, and Sally changed the way I practiced Judaism. Um, it was a, an evolution. Uh, and, and it wasn't just Sally, but it was what we did along the way and, and various things that, that changed me. I never kept kosher even though I grew up in a somewhat kosher home. Um, and I don't today, but I, I changed along the way that I don't, I don't uh, eat treif, what's considered in the Bible as treif. I won't, I won't eat uh, you know, shellfish, pork, those kinds of, which I used to. And that was part of the evolution of who we were as, as a couple. Um, and other things, other influences along the way, like the young leadership 
experience I had, the Wexner experience I had, all of those played together in, in making me who I am uh, today. Um, but uh, we, we got married uh, when I got out of medical school and, and uh, I think uh, she got pregnant while I was an intern and we had uh, three boys in four and a half years. Um, and um, our older two sons are 13 and a half months apart, and, which is interesting because they grew up almost like twinning, uh, right. but not. Uh, but, but it was, um, and um, uh, during that period of time, we m were in Ann Arbor, then we were in Detroit, and then we eventually were in Brooklyn, and then um, we were in Montgomery, Alabama, all before the kids were school age. Uh, I think Joel, our oldest son, started school in in Montgomery. Um, but um, they, uh, and then we moved back to uh, Southfield. Was it always your intention to move back here? No. Um, we looked around. I, I had an opportunity to moonlight in, in the Air Force. Um, I did some moonlighting uh, covering practice in, in uh, uh, Eastern Alabama and uh, Auburn uh, and Opelika, Alabama um, for a couple of years on weekends. Um, we were in Atlanta a little bit. We saw, I had seen New York. I, we saw the, the South. Um, and when it came time to come to decide where we were going, as an orthopedic surgeon, I could have written my ticket anywhere. Um, we just decided that suburban Detroit was as nice as suburban anywhere. And our family was still in Detroit, although we moved back and my mom got remarried and moved away and my aunt moved away and it left my brother and I in the city. But um, it's, uh, we just felt that, uh, that being home was important, that, uh, that having our kids grow up with family was important. Um, we did and we turned out okay. So. We felt that family was very important, and, and again, living in Detroit, Detroit's a great place. The, the, the more you're away, the more you realize what a great city Detroit was. And yes, they've gone through some tough times, but, but more than that, what a great Jewish community Detroit is. Um, and uh, coming back, uh, not knowing that, but learning that was made it made our decision very easy. Tell us, tell me about your boys and their spouses and your grandkids. The boys um, all live here. Uh, Joel, our oldest, is a uh, attorney at Honigman. Married, um, has uh, two girls, uh, uh, twelve and ten. Uh, we have a bat mitzvah coming up in May of his daughter, um, and he's done very well. Uh, they live in, uh, in Bloomfield Hills, uh, not far from us. Um, Howard, our middle son, uh, is in sports management. Uh, he started in medical school and uh, came home one day and said, it's not for me. I don't want to give up what I love, which was sports. And uh, I said, fine. You know, people would ask me, what would you think? You know, I said, I want him to be happy. I want him to get up every day. I love what I do. I love getting up every day and for, for the last 40 years and going to work. Um, so, and he, through some various jobs that he had, one with the Detroit Tigers, wound up in, a, in the sports world. Uh, he's doing sports management now. Um, and uh, he has two girls, ten, uh, 13. Sloan had her bat mitzvah last September, and uh, uh, Orly is turning 11 in a couple of weeks. Um, and Noah is our youngest. Um, and Noah is, um, well, he and his wife have a uh, web design company called EPK Design, which Ellen is really do doing. And a few years ago, Noah and uh, a friend, Gabe Rubin, 
started an internet business called Gamer Saloon, uh, where they arrange gaming skill matches for competition, for money. Uh, but it's not gambling because it's a game of skill. And they're doing very well. They're, they're really, um, uh, uh, this year is going to be, well, last year was their best year, and they had, uh, uh, I, I, in the millions of dollars of matches which they arranged. Um, and this year's even better. And of course, their dream is, like all entrepreneurs, is that someday somebody's going to come and offer them a lot of money. Um, and they might, because they've been told in the business that their, their model, uh, what they're doing, is probably the best model out there in terms of a very limited field of, of online gaming. Uh, so uh, they have two boys. Um, their oldest is, just turned 13 yesterday and has a bar mitzvah coming up in about three weeks. And uh, their uh, younger son is 11 and a half. And um, they give us lots of joy and lots of plays to go see and lots of dancing to go see because I didn't have any girls, so I didn't know about dancing. And um, uh, lots of basketball games. Uh, and uh, we love it. And uh, we, we have Shabbat dinners available. But as the kids, the grandkids get older, we see a little less of them, uh, unfortunately. They, uh, two of the three came frequently to our house. <coughs> but that's changed. But we still, they know there's a Shabbat dinner to come eat. And sometimes at the end of the week, they'll call up and say, we're going to show up. Uh, so, um, uh, but it's, it, it's great. And, and the greatest was the end of December when, when Sally and I decided for our 50th anniversary that we were going to take our family to Israel. And um, we went with Temple Israel. Noah was a member there. And two of our three sons went. Uh, with the grandchildren, and uh, it was probably the best thing that we've ever done. Uh, it was just a marvelous trip. Temple Israel did a great job, um, and being in Israel with our grandchildren was the best. Couldn't have thought of a better 50th anniversary trip or, or present for us uh, than to do that. Well, this is not a test, Richard, but for the historical record and for your well-being, I want to make sure you name all of your grandchildren because you, you haven't up until now, and uh, your uh, and your and your sons' spouses too. Okay. Well, Joel is is married to Heidi Brode, and their their daughters are Darby, who who's going to be thirteen, and Cammy, who just turned ten. We have very interesting names. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Noah, well, Howard is, was married to uh, Aaron Cronick. They got divorced, and he remarried last year to a uh, nice lady named Terry Warren, uh, who was not married, and it's, it was wonderful. The, the, and he's, they're very happy. And uh, he has two daughters from the first marriage, uh, uh, Sloan and Orly. Again, we're keeping with common names. Um, I found out Sloan was Ferris Bueller's girlfriend. You know. So, um, and uh, Noah's, uh, Noah's married to uh, Ellen Paborski, who grew up in New York, but they met in Michigan. And um, uh, their two children are Jesse, the 13-year-old, and Adam. And you're so not too I know. And, you're and not I too know their birthdays, too. <laughs> and you're not too proud of them. No, not at all. Yeah. Okay, I'm shifting gears again. Um, you talk, was Fresh Air Society your first uh, active Jewish involvement as an adult? And talk yeah. a little bit about your, yes. your, your Jewish career. And um, we're gonna talk about how you got involved in Federation in a, in a moment. Um, th yeah, that was, I mean, I was in the center. I played basketball like all of us growing up in, in Northwest Detroit at, at uh, uh, Myers and, and Curtis um, used the facilities, but really just assumed they were part of yeah. 
our neighborhood. Yeah, I'm talking more about after you but, became an adult. But as an adult, my first contact was working at, at Tamarack. Um, I wasn't involved otherwise because being a resident is a full-time job. Um, and, and we were away for much of that time. My first contact with a federation, the first gift I ever made, was that we were in uh, Montgomery, Alabama in 1973, and uh, there was a little war in Israel. Um, and um, we, we were involved with, this, with the synagogue in Montgomery, and uh, had a good relationship with the rabbi. And we, when the Yom Kippur War occurred, there was a community, a Jewish community meeting. And I went, and um, they called cards. And uh, um, I had never, you know, I didn't know anything about campaign or anything, but the dollars that were raised were significant at the time. Montgomery had a good, very good Jewish community, small but very active in, in some wealth in the community. Um, and Sally and I were amazed at the dollars. And I think I wrote, wrote a check for $180, which for me at the time was a lot of money. Uh, you know, I think my salary in, in, as a, in the Air Force was about $17,000 for the year. Um, but that was our first involvement of, of stepping forward. Um, and then we came back to Detroit. Um, and um, it was a whole different experience uh, of, of what happened. The, my journey changed once with Sally. It changed again coming back to Detroit. Um, and that's when I really started getting involved uh, in, the, in the community. So talk about that a little bit. So when we came back, well, I, my, my experience was that uh, I had some good friends from Detroit, friends from Michigan, uh, friends growing up that we kept in contact with. And we moved back into Southfield. Um, our next door neighbors were the Hubermans. Carol Huberman was my fifth grade girlfriend when I moved to Bagley. So uh, my wife wasn't so sure, but um, they're best friends for the last 40 years. Uh, we, um, uh, and I had a job with uh, Woodland Medical, and I was on staff at Sinai, and I was on staff at, at Mount Carmel. And the people knew the Krugel name from my grandmother from the store, and my father had been somewhat active, although I don't know that he was active. I don't know what his Federation activity was. It just never was around our house. You know, my mom had the requisite uh, blue boxes that she put money into, but we just never talked about Jewish community. It was, it was interesting. Um, so I went through six months of being here, and, and uh, my friend Eddie Lumberg was the, uh, the president of the junior division uh, that year. And in the spring, um, I said to Eddie, I said one day, I said, you know, I, I've been here six months. Nobody's ever contacted me for any money. I said, how do you give money to the Federation? And uh, Eddie said, well, I'll take your pledge. Uh, so he said, what do you want to give? I said, well, I'll give $1,000. And he said, oh, for sure I'll take your pledge. <laughs> and that was my first gift. Um, and I didn't join young adult or anything. And then the next fall, um, a friend of mine said, there's a, a recruitment meeting for a trip to Israel. And this was 1976. Um, and there was a large UJA mission called next year, or this year in Jerusalem. And young leadership was recruiting a, a plane full, a 747. And um, Larry Jack here, who was a friend of mine from high school, um, was leading a bus. And uh, Stanley Frankel, who I didn't know, I knew Judy, his wife from, from college, 
um, was also in, involved. And so I went to this recruitment meeting and was, uh, was really blown away by the whole idea. The reason we went was because in the Air Force, the two years I spent there, the second year in the Air, in, in, that I was in the Air Force, we lived on base. And there was a young Israeli family that came on base. Um, and the, uh, there was, uh, the family was named Ben Nun, and, and the Aviu Ben Nun was a pilot in the, uh, US, in the uh, Israeli Air Force. And he had been the first Israeli pilot invited to study in the American War College. And it happened in 1974. So they lived on base, we lived on base. I think we were the Jewish community of Maxwell Air Force Base, on base. Um, and uh, we got to know them very well. And they were wonderful people. And as we were leaving, in, and they were leaving, Aviu said to us, when are you coming to Israel? And I said, we don't know, you know, what's Israel? You know, and, um, uh, but that put a bug in our, in our head. And uh, then we went to this, th this recruitment meeting and Larry sold us. So we said, well, we signed up to go. And um, we did, had a great time. Um, we were on Larry's bus. Um, I was solicited in the back of the bus. I guess I gave a good gift. Um, and um, uh, we saw the Ben Nuns the last day of the trip, and I was worried because we had left the bus. And I said, you know, we've got to be at the airport at 7 o'clock in the morning. The planes, Avio said, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people. Um, and uh, he did get us to the airport, and, and we came back home. And uh, that summer, I was asked to, to go on the uh, Young Leadership Cabinet of UJA. And um, who asked you? Uh, actually, Joel Gershenson uh, was the one that asked me over spare ribs. There was a little Another problem story. there, but <laughs> but that led to my stop eating spare I, ribs. I so. Um, and uh, so I went on the cabinet, and uh, the cabinet was a great experience. I was on the Young Leadership Cabinet for four years. Um, during that time, I was the campaign chairman of the cabinet one year, and I was the missions chairman of the cabinet one year. Um, as Stanley and, and Larry were chairman back to back, um, so they put us to work. Uh, but it was a great experience. So I learned about community. I learned about national, what was being done in, in the United States. I learned about UJA. I learned about philanthropy. Uh, we were put to work. You put us to work doing leadership development, and we had great leadership development programs uh, for couples in this community. Um, I went to Israel probably three times in that four years. Uh, I think in one year, I actually went three times in one year to doing various things, either nationally or locally. Um, and um, and we, we were the experts. We went out and solicited small communities in Michigan and, and spoke for, for campaign. It was really just a great leadership time. And, and you got involved and you met some, and we, we still have friends from all over the country that we see whenever we're in town, like in LA, we have several friends that we go see all the time that came from that experience. So that was the, the, the one major experience. And of course, being on the cabinet, you were put to use locally as well, and I got involved in campaign. I got involved with, uh, with Tamarack Fresh Air Camp, got on the board, um, and eventually, as I had said before, I, I became president for three years of, of uh, Fresh Air Society. Um, and we continued traveling to, to Israel. Uh, and we continued taking missions. Sally and I led missions of all sizes, one bus, two bus. Uh, for the cabinet, I did a 10 bus mission. Um, and uh, we were involved in, the, uh, in uh, David Hermelin's uh, first miracle mission in 93. 
Um, I think I went on all but one of the miracle missions. And uh, along the way, we made friends, and we stayed friends with the Ben Nuns all through this time. Every time we went to Israel, we saw them. And as our kids started going, they saw them, and they lived at their house. And, and it, it, they're, they're like family. They really are. They're very, we, we still see them every time we're there. They'll come to see us. We go to see them. We'll go to stay with them. Um, he wound up being a commander of the Air Force in his career. And then when he retired, he became the uh, CEO of uh, United Motors Israel, which happens just to be the GM affiliate in Israel. So all of a sudden, Avila was visiting us. Uh, instead of us going the other way, Small he was world. here yeah. in Detroit. Um, and uh, uh, somewhere along the way, Sally and I, well, Sally got into the Wexner group in Detroit. Uh, we were group number two of the Wexner uh, leadership program. Again, a great program. Um, it, because Les Wexner, who owned the Limited, was asked to be chairman of the UJA. And he said, I, I guess he said yes, but he says, why are you asking me? I have no idea about Jewish things. And what he did with his money was he started a leadership program for free initially. He paid the whole shot and educated us, uh, groups selected leadership development groups. Sounds in like various, it was as much for him as for, yeah, for the groups. Yeah, in, in, in various cities. Um, we learned weekly, um, and uh, they brought in some of the, the greatest minds in Judaism, uh, 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 David Hartman and, and uh, Dean Steinsaltz, and and, you know, other names, um, what's his name, Riskin, uh, Shlomo Riskin. Shlomo. And uh, it was just amazing. And it wound up at the end of two years with a trip to um, uh, Israel. And what it did and what Les's idea was is to teach emerging leadership the sources where to look for how to make Jewish decisions. We have a 4,000 year history all written down about making decisions and the Talmud and, and all these things that we didn't learn. And, and Les's idea was to make leadership or give leadership the opportunity to learn. Where, where Jewish decisions are made. And it was a great two years. I joined the second year. Um, they asked me to join um, the group. Uh, I had gone to all the retreats with Sally the first year and had looked at the material she'd brought home, but I missed out on some stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was a great, great experience. Um, you look at the leadership in Detroit, many of whom came. Not everybody was successful in what they did, but, but many came out of the Wexner experience. More came out of the cabinet experience. But those two experiences changed what I did. Um, I started studying. I've studied for 15 years now with partners in Torah. Uh, with uh, Rabbi Dov Lokic. Um, we study pretty much every week. We've been through the Torah. We've been through the... Um, we, we spent three or four years uh, going through the entire Tanakh and, uh, from start to finish um, and, and just learning, just talking and learning and, and questioning because I ask a lot of questions um, ab about what's in the what's in those sources and it's amazing what's in those sources and it's, it's a way of life and it's a very for the most part ethical way of life so um uh 
that's how I got involved. And I just, the, the, what happens when you get involved and you do federation work, uh, one word drops out of your vocabulary, the word no. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say no. So I've done, I've, I've chaired the alliance locally. Um, I've been involved in uh, Israel and overseas. Uh, Sal and I have been, we don't even know anymore how many times we go. Uh, we, we led the, miracle, the last miracle mission. It's time for another one. I'll put that on record. Um, it's, uh, but, and I chaired the missions committee. Um, um, I chaired Israel and overseas. Uh, um, and I, it's just things to do. Um, and, and the need to get, to get them done. Um, my latest foray is with the, the Jewish Community Relations Council. I'm not sure how that happened, uh, but I wasn't doing anything a couple of years ago and was, on, was asked to be the federation representative on their uh, nominating committee. And uh, at the end of the process, I said, uh, do you have an extra spot? Maybe I'd like to come on the JCRC for a little while. And they said, sure. And, and that's what I'm doing. And then I was asked to be president. Uh, it's... Um, I'm going to want to talk about that in some detail in a little bit. Giving back, giving to the community and giving back, it, there's nothing more rewarding. Um, and um, it's, it's just been a great journey for, for both of us. And Sally's been as involved as she I have. Has. And, and, in both as a professional and and as a, a lay leader. Um, and the culmination was last October when, I don't know why, but I was asked to be the awardee for the Butzel Award. And I was very honored. And uh, um, it's a very elite group of, of individuals. Uh, many who are my mentors, who have, have been Butzel awardees, and many who are my close friends. Um, uh, but it, it really was, I was very proud to, to have been chosen to do that. Well, speaking personally, they couldn't have made a better choice. Well, thanks. Uh, let's talk about Israel a little bit. It's obviously played a critical role in your lives, and I think in our generation's lives. Do you, ha and you, you know, you have a, a, an interesting view from the community relations perspective as well as the Israel perspective. Does <coughs> Israel play the same kind of role, in your opinion, in the next gen uh, generation of people? And what do we have to do or to make that a seminal part of their um, Jewish uh, DNA? The fair question? Yeah. And, and I think Israel is, is the Jewish DNA. Uh, I think that, that of all Jewish experiences, Israel is the seminal experience for most Jews. We see it in birthright. Birthright is, is one of the most successful programs that the Jewish, the world Jewish community, and certainly the North American Jewish community has ever done. Um, because it's the experience of birthright really changes lives. We have, an ex we have to do things to help that, but getting people to go to Israel, I'd say in my experience, and Sally and I have accompanied probably thousands of Detroiters over the years on, on experiences in Israel have really been a successful part of making people Jewish. Uh, I think the experience, the, the fact that we have a homeland, the history um, is, is vital to to everything i i would absolutely love to see every single jewish child in the born in the united states get an opportunity somewhere in their first 18 years to go to israel i think it's vital 
for, for the Jewish people. But Israel's changed. Israel, you know, I, we, were, we were not involved when, before 1967, when Israel was the David. In 1967, the, the world changed in, in terms of the Middle East, and, it, and then over the next 10 years, Israel kind of morphed from, from the David to the Goliath, and, and it's changed a lot about Israel. Uh, we have to sell Israel now. Um, it's, the, the, the view of Israel in, in the world and the United States has changed. Um, and I think it, it, you see the change culminate this past summer in Gaza. Um, and uh, the, the view of Israel, the world view of Israel changed this summer. Um, a lot of it due to media, a lot of it due to, to, to the way the world's changed because we now live in a 24-7 media world. So. You learn more when in 1973, when when we got involved because of the uh, the Yom Kippur War, you got news at you know seven o'clock in the morning and six at right. night and eleven at night and you had two and a half hours of news at the most right. and it was hard to even follow what was going on. Now just turn on CNN or Fox or whatever your your choice. Um, and have to hope that the information is is accurate. accurate. Yeah, which it often is not. And, and, and you have to know that. Right. And, and the problem is, is that most people that, that watch the news don't know what's true, what's truth and what's not truth. Um, I, I, I think, again, I think Israel is a seminal event for, for a Jewish person, uh, be it family or anything. Taking our family to see those kids and, and to, have them know and know that they were on the ground and that they were at Masada and that they were in Jerusalem and that they touched, put notes in the wall and that they did, uh, they had bar mitzvahs overlooking the old city uh, through, you know, through the temple. And, and those kinds of events are lifetime events. And they'll go back. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've seen it in birthright. I know lots of young people that have gone on birthright and then gone back. And we meet people all the time on our travels in Israel that came on birthright and are there on Al Aliyah now. And um, I, it's, it's something we have to cherish. It's something we have to protect. I, I don't like what's going on right now. Uh, uh, in Israel. I don't like their pol politics. I, I hope it changes in this next election. We need to do things differently as far as I'm concerned. But it's Israel and it's there. And somebody said the other day, I was reading uh, something in the Wall Street Journal and uh, about anti-Semitism in Europe, which is again on the rise and we we are being bombarded with events unfortunately all the time now uh, what's different and somebody said there's a state of israel there was a dry bone <coughs> cartoon yesterday right. there's a state of israel right. so you know you raise obviously important and valid points related to reaching out and getting people to israel it's always been the glue that, that has held us together. But if I may be so bold, and I, I wanna talk about the challenges you're facing in the <coughs> CRC area, and whether, whether we're doing the kind of job that we should be doing and what more could we be doing. But I just wanna go back to the one thing that you said. We're, Birthright and all those things are a wonderful program, but we're not gonna get everybody to Israel. You know, that's the goal. So what do we have to do from your perspective with, the, with those people who are on the periphery or maybe is, well, I'll let you talk. Well, I, I, I think we have to educate. Uh, I, it, it comes, a lot of it comes down to education. Um, yeah, we're probably not going to get everybody to Israel, but we should. Absolutely. We should. And there's money. There's lots of money out there now. I, I, I ask Sally every day, 
you know, when we talk about things. I said, when did millions become billions? But it has. And there's lots of people with lots of money. And we have to tap into that. We really have to use those dollars. And we have to make that opportunity available. Well, some people won't go, just like day schools. You can make them free. Not every Jewish child will go to day school. There have been studies that have shown that. Um, but it's important if you could get them to day school. It would be a great thing. Same with Israel. We, how do we do it? We just have to keep educating. We have to get the right people in the right places. We have to be on campus. Um, the uh, Jewish federations of North America are trying very hard to, to, to do some of these things and to organize educational efforts for the campuses. And we've got to work very hard against BDS. Uh, uh, and, and we have to be around. We have to help our Hillels. Uh, I, I just came back from a few weeks ago from the JFNA meetings, the board meetings, because I'm on the board. And we talked about this. We talked about it's, all, it's education. We have to help our young adults be comfortable because many of our young Jewish students are not comfortable. And we're fighting a very sophisticated enemy, the, the Islamic fundamentalist world is very educated, very organized, um, and, and uh, uh, they have placed professionals on our campuses. What happened at the University of Michigan last spring with BDS, we were fighting professionals right. that were leading the Arab students. Uh, we didn't have professionals. We had a few. Uh, Hillel did a great job. Uh, we were involved, and we talked to Hillel and Tilly Seamus, the, the director now. And Tilly said, our students want to handle this. Support us. Help us. But don't flood the campus. And we didn't. And it worked out great. We won that one. Um, but we have to be available, and we, we have the resources. We have the educators. We need money to support them. We need those efforts, and we need to educate our students, and we need to make them knowledgeable. How do we make them knowledgeable? Well, we educate them. Uh, we try to do it in high schools. We get them to Israel. Um, we give them support on campuses, but let them grow. Let them learn. And, uh, and, and that's what I think we, we really have to do for, for the future of our Jewish community. So it's a natural segue into, you know, we're in momentous times. We're always in momentous times, but this is particularly momentous times. And as the president of the Jewish uh, Community Relations Council, you're in a unique perspective to understand and see the challenges that uh, we as a community are facing. So I was wondering if you might spend a few moments talking about what you believe those challenges are, not only locally, which is a unique community, but in nationally and internationally, and what we have to do in the, in the future to um, make certain that we're on solid ground going forward. Well, I, I think the challenge is, is radical Islam to, to, to Jew, Judaism. Anti-Semitism is anti-Jewish. Even though there are many people in the world, non-Jewish, who would say, oh no, we're, an we're, we're not anti-Jewish, or, 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 you know, to, to separate anti-Semitism from anti-Jewish. But I think they're synonymous, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we live in a unique community. I work in Dearborn. One of my offices is in Dearborn. Um, we live within a community that has 250,000 Arab uh, population. We have a large Chaldean Christian 
Arab population. Um, we have to deal with them on a, on a, on a sensible top of topics, so, you know, not fighting, but talking. We've, we've reached out as, as a JCRC uh, last summer uh, when, when uh, ISIS uh, was, was threatening the Chaldean community in, in Iraq, and, and they're still under threat. We reached out to, to the Chaldean community. We talked with them. We wrote a very strong position paper from the Jewish perspective that actually got published nationally in the Chaldean press uh, that came from our, our JCRC. Um, we've lobbied or used our resources to get to people in Washington to, to try and lobby for them to, to change uh, immigration practices, to liberalize uh, the ability to get them out of Iraq. Um, I know that there have been efforts in the national Jewish community through HIAS, which still does exist, to, to, to help with immigration, uh, because these are an endangered population. And um, that's part of who we are. It's not, we're not just homeophobes, you know, folks. And, and I mean, we live in a world and we care about people. Um, and, and so those are some of the things that the JCRC is doing. This summer, I tried very hard as much as I could get an opportunity to, through JCRC, to educate the Detroit community generally about what's really going on. Uh, that, you know, because there was a lot of myths out there, you know, that Israel was killing innocent people and, and, and they, had a very bad publicity summer because of it. Uh, and they're very, their enemy is very sophisticated. The, the, Islam, the radicalized is Islam, and we have to call it what it is, despite what President Obama wants us not to use, but we need to say what's what. And this is radical Islam. And um, it is based on their their beliefs of the religion and the Koran. Now, not all Islam is radical. Far be it. But there's almost two billion Islamic people in the world. And say it's 10%. Wow. That's a lot of people. Um, you know, we have 18 million Jews, maybe. 10% isn't so many people. Uh, but but we, it, we have to reach out, we have to educate, we have to take every opportunity we can. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we spent a lunch with, uh, <coughs> with uh, WXYZ news staff, uh, going, briefing them on Israel, on the Jewish community, on what's going on, answering their questions, um, letting them know we're around. Um, Last week, I met with uh, Mark Hackle, the, uh, uh, what's his role, with Macomb County. He's the, mm, uh, I I know the, the head of Macomb County, basically. Uh, talking with him, letting him know that, you know, there is a Jewish history in Macomb County, uh, that uh, Mount Clemens was a, a favorite resort place for old Jewish women in the 50s and 60s at their sulfur baths and, and we have Jewish cemeteries sprinkled around Macomb County and there was a Jewish community in, right. on the east side of Detroit at one point in a thriving Jewish community. And so we're reaching out. We, we try to outreach to whoever we can. We, um, last, this past Monday we had our new Congress people into Federation and we briefed them about what are we do, and they talked to us, and we heard from Debbie Dingle and uh, Dave Trott and uh, Brenda Lawrence and uh, even uh, John Conyers, the dean of the Democratic House. <laughs> Quotation. <laughs> Quotations. Quotations uh, was there, um, and so we are trying. We are reaching out. Are we up to the challenge, we Richard? In your yes, opinion? we have the knowledge. Are we up Do to the challenge as a community in, in total? I, that I don't know. It takes money. 
and we're, and we're struggling right now. Um, I mean, the, 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010 was a hard time for Detroit, the Jewish community. Our campaign dropped five million dollars overnight. Five million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, and we've seen it in, in our funding of the services that we can fund because that's all the extra, that's all the fluff, that's all the, the, the dollars that, that we use for essential programs, but not frontline essential programs, you know, not keeping people in food and shelter and, and health, but preserving our Jewishness and our Jewish community. Do we, you know, this question wasn't in anything I asked, but it just comes to mind. Do we as a community of agencies uh, who have their own, you know, specific agendas, do we have a responsibility as agencies to the total community related to this um, sanctity and, you know, of our Jewish people and vitality of our Jewish people and the issues that we're going through from a political kind of a standpoint? Absolutely. I mean, our primary concern as a Jewish federation is, is the Jewish community because we're the only ones that'll do that. Um, and and we, we have a responsibility and our agencies are doing it. We need money. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that our community is shrinking. We have probably 65,000 now from the 20-year-old statistics at that point, it was 96,000. I never believed that number. I said, where are they? But that's what the number was. Right. Uh, but now we're at 65. Um, and we're an, old, we're an aging community. Right. Our last demographic study showed that we have the oldest Jewish community, percentage-wise, in the country outside of the Sun Belt. Right. That's an amazing fact. In Detroit, our percentage of elderly is higher than in any other community. And that's because those elderly can't afford to move down. That, or they, or we do a good job. Yeah, and both. they come back. Both, you're right. They'll go to Florida when they're 70 and 80. Come back. They come back here yeah. when they're 90. Very good point. To to live here because the services that we provide for our elderly are, are really excellent. But it, it would seem to me that there's some things like, you know, there are community relations issues at this, you know, we could provide more at the, at the Jewish Community Center and other, you know, a camp and, you know, to make our, you know, make our populations more knowledgeable. Um, Absolutely. You know, I'm not supposed to editorialize, but I'm in this regard. I don't think that we're as prepared as a community as we could for this new onslaught that you talk about uh, from the, um, you know, the Arab community, the, the, the radical Arab community. Yeah, I, you know, fortunately in America so far, we've had isol very isolated incidents and they really haven't been very anti-Jewish. You know, they attacked the, the military couple of incidents where shooters were on military bases. We've seen very little anti-Semitic activity, overt like in Europe. Will it not come here? I, of course it's going to. Somewhere, somewhere in time, if, if what's going on in the Middle East continues. That's why we have to fight it. I mean, I'm very concerned about our, the American foreign policy right now. I, I am not a fan of, of the, uh, the current administration's foreign policy. I think that they're selling us way short and we're, we're letting the world get out of hand. And, you know, the world did better when there was a policeman. Even though it cost us a lot of money, the world did better when the United States was out there. Um, and that's not the case right now. It is, you're correct. And, and, I, and I worry about that. And I worry about the future. I got, you know, six grandchildren here from age 10 to 13 and a half. I worry about their future. I worry about where they're gonna be living in, in 10 years and what kind of, you know, Jewish world are they gonna live in. 
and and it's it's very scary. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, we're com we're coming near the end. So you you mentioned um, some important names not only to you but to me: Stanley Franco, Larry Jack here, Joel Gershenson. Who are the people over your career <coughs> who have uh, had the greatest impact on who you are and how you're doing your Jewish business anyway? Well, um, those are my friends. They've been friends for a long time. Uh, Stanley and Larry and, and Joel and, and uh, Dan Geyer and Mark Hauser and, and, and Jane Sherman. And I mean, these are our, our contemporaries and, and they've certainly affected all of us um, in, in who they are and what they do in various ways. Uh, throughout my time in, in Detroit and involved in the community. But I had the opportunity to know some others. Uh, Bill Berman, number one on my list. Because I see Bill every time, you know, I don't see him in the winters because he's in Florida, but in the summer, I see him every Shabbos or almost every Shabbos. And he's an amazing man uh, for what he's done uh, for, for not only Detroit, but for North America and Jewish community and for the world Jewish community. Um, and I've learned a lot from Bill. Um, he's been a mentor and, and he's sure been a role model uh, as, as a, uh, a very bright man with very good ideas and great leadership skills. Um, so he's number one on my list. Um, Connie Giles, Connie's been a friend and a colleague but he's uh, uh, a little bit older than I am, and, and I've I've learned a lot from him. He's got he's a wonderful speaker. I had to suffer through many early years where we spoke together, and I had to follow Connie. <laughs> that's that's unfair. Uh, but uh, but he's I've learned a lot from him, and he's been a good friend and and a, and a real mentor. Um, I had the opportunity to know the Frankels, uh, Sam and Jean, um, and, and to really sit down and talk to them at times. Um, I remember Jean being in my office one time uh, several years ago when we were bringing the um, Israeli campers. And I think it was somewhere in the second or third year of the whole program, and they were running out of money. And then I heard that Sam and Jean had, had funded the program for a year. And Jean was in the office, and, and I mentioned to her that I have this little spot in my heart for fresh air and had been a former president, and, and I was so excited for what they did. And she said, Doctor, she said to me, my father told me, that money is like manure. It's no good unless you spread it around. <laughs> and I said, absolutely. Great. Uh, you know, but I had the opportunity to know them. Uh, Larry's parents. Uh, I didn't know Joe a lot because he died somewhere mm -hmm. when too I early. was growing up, yeah. way too early. But Edith, I knew and, and uh, very well. And it was wonderful to be able to talk to her and learn from her. And, and that's what this community has offered. I didn't really know Max Fisher well, but I had some opportunities with him. But I got to listen to what he had to say a lot uh, coming through uh, the Federation. Uh, some of the leadership uh, of Federation, the professional leadership. Uh, I think Bob Aronson was a great leader. Uh, I enjoyed working with you over the years um, uh, when, when we were both younger and, and worked harder. Um, Mark Davidoff, uh, David Page, wonderful man. I learned a lot from David over the years. Uh, I worked with him on the Jewish Fund for me since its inception and learned a lot. Penny Blumenstein, I mean, we've just been so blessed with, with such great leadership, uh, both locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and it's, these are the people that I've learned from. Um, and, and I learn every day with my colleagues. 
um, and uh, it's it's been great because we're still friends and we still talk and we still see each other and I see Jack here almost every week at partners when one of us shows up um, and and things like that so and and we still see Stanley all the time and uh, and those are the, the things that that have made my life um, better um, and it, it makes you again you, you you just learn to live um, without the word no um, and um, and and the emerging leadership I've also had the ability to have relationships with and I think we're in pretty good shape I know who's out there uh, uh, you know, I've worked with Larry Wolf, and I've worked with Ben Rosenthal, and and uh, Matt Lester, and and uh, Jim Bellinson, and and potential future leadership of this of this community, and I, and it's uh, it's there, uh, but but we know that about Detroit. Uh, I've spent the last ten years playing nationally with with JFNA, and I chair their financial relations committee now. Be, they got tired of hearing me complain about dues, so they gave me the job. But they, um, uh, when Detroit talks, they listen. People listen. I, I, I was at a meeting a couple of years ago during, during the, the mini recession or the recent recession that we had, um, talking about uh, Project Hesed. And I got up at a national meeting and described Project Hesed, what we were doing in Detroit for people that needed health care, that, that were caught in the middle, that didn't have Medicaid and didn't have Medicare and, and, and had no, no cash and, and had good jobs but ran, you know, lost them. And, and they had no, no health care. And, and Detroit stepped up. A thousand doctors said, we'll do it. We'll do it for nothing. We'll give pro bono care. And I, I talked about the system, and everybody said, you're doing what? I don't know if any other community had a Hesed, but they sure listened. So that's what's great about Detroit. That's what's great about working for Detroit for the last 40 years. And I'm not through. I'll, I'll still be around. I tell them. I hope so. Um, and and uh, But it's proud because we are Detroit and everybody, people know the Detroit Jewish community and they listen and, and, and we've been very innovative. I, the miracle missions that every community is doing now started right here through David Hermelin and, and others. Mm -hmm. But it, it was, those are the things that make me proud to be a Jewish Detroiter. I think we've interwoven most of the questions in, in our conversation, but I'll give you one last, uh, I think you've just said eloquently what I think you wanted to say, but is there, if there's any, any closing words that you want to say or... Uh... I just think we have, as, as I said at the end of my Butzel speech, the journey's not over. The journey goes on. And, and we're all part of a Jewish journey. I strongly believe in the Jewish journey. Uh, some, it starts sometimes, some it starts another, some it takes a long time. But the journey doesn't stop. And we, we live in a very ugly world right now. It will change, we've lived through it before. But we have to, every day, fight for what we believe is is our rights and, and to live a good life. And as a Jew, sometimes that's been forgotten in the world we live in. Richard, can't thank you enough. This is a wonderful addition to well, the Oral you. History Project. And we're so delighted that you were able to come and spend these moments with us. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.